Your dream is to get a master in machine learning at some prestigious university. What concrete steps can you take towards making it a reality? Most videos of this kind on YouTube will be from people who managed to get in and who will tell you what worked for them. Great, but that's a sample size of one. If you're a bit smarter, you'll want to hear from those on the other side, those who actually do the selection and listen to what they actually look for. So if you are smarter, you've come to the right place. I can give you the inside story about what works and what definitely doesn't work in graduate studies application. Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I am a professor in the University of Cambridge Department of the Science and Technology of Computers, and I'm one of those officers who wade through the hundreds of applications we receive every year for our master program in advanced computer science. If you want to be called for interview, you need a very thorough preparation that starts many years before you apply. To apply, you submit a form supported by a portfolio of evidence, and the most obvious part of that form is your track record from your previous degree. Needless to say, if you're applying to a prestigious university, the admissions officers want to get brilliant people, so make sure your grades are top-notch. That's not something you do when you write your application. That's something you must have done in the years leading up to it. If you have a couple of weak marks, don't worry about it, provided they are in irrelevant topics, such as, you know, religious studies, if such stuff was compulsory in your undergraduate degree. But if your bad marks are in fundamental subjects, such as mathematics or programming, then you've got a problem, because your, if your basics are weak, then you will probably struggle with the more advanced material that you will have to deal with in the master. Another important input is what your referees say about you. Of course, you choose your referees, and you choose people who like you, obviously, so they will typically only say great things. So we also ask them to provide some objective comparison points, such as, you know, was this person in the top quarter of the students you had this year, or maybe in the top 10%, or the top 1%, or the best you've seen in five years? And actually, how many other students are we comparing against? So this gives us a bit of calibration for all these grandiose statements. And also, close references, references that are not shown to the candidate, usually suggest that they can be a bit more honest than if they show it to you too. Also, the reputation and the track record of the person writing the reference influences the credibility of their statements. For example, if the referee has a Nobel Prize or a Turing Award, it doesn't in any way imply that the student is of the same caliber, but it does at least suggest A, that the referee knows what excellence actually means, and B, that she probably won't spoil her own reputation by magnifying the student's achievements unless the student truly deserves that level of praise. So who you choose as your referee does matter. An input that is not terribly important, even though many candidates overthink it, is the so-called personal statement. You know, the stuff you say about yourself, what you're passionate about, what you want to do when you grow up, and so forth. Anyone can say anything they like there, so it's not terribly useful for selecting the best candidates. But if you have done anything relevant that makes you stand out, then be sure to mention it, especially if you've already had a go at something that is rarely done at undergraduate level, such as, you know, publishing a peer-reviewed paper, or writing a widely used piece of software, or starting a company. I mean, we don't expect any of that. We certainly don't request it, but very few people do any of that. So if you did it, then you will stand out in a good way. Don't bother with stuff that is exceptional but totally irrelevant to your degree, such as sports achievements, having traveled around the world, and all that kind of stuff. What is instead rather more important than your personal statement is your research proposal. This tells us something much more informative about you and your potential as a graduate student than your personal statement does. Have you done your homework? Have you investigated the field? Have you figured out what the interesting problems are? Have you figured out which interesting problems are still unsolved? Have you read up enough of the literature to understand what approaches people have already attempted in order to solve them? Have you figured out why the problems you selected are still unsolved despite all that? Have you got a plausible approach for how you could make an original contribution there? It doesn't have to be earth-shattering, but it has to bring at least a little bit of novelty while still being within the realm of the stuff you can realistically do. Have you been able to draw up a sensible plan on how to get there? Have you produced a timetable with reasonable deliverables along the way? All of that is very important, and it's quite difficult to do. We don't expect you to get it right by yourself. In fact, once you do get admitted, then your supervisor will mentor you while you learn how to do it properly and you will rewrite and refine your project proposal after you're officially here, probably several times. But the way you approach this difficult planning task at submission time, even if you end up doing a different project altogether, tells us a lot on whether you have the right aptitude and the right potential for research. And that is the part of your application that you can focus on now, as opposed to in the previous three years. So ideally, to get admitted to a master in a prestigious university, you should 
prepare for that a few years ahead by doing extremely well in your undergraduate years so that you get excellent exam scores and excellent reference letters from your most reputable professors, plus possibly some relevant extracurricular achievements such as a peer-reviewed paper, uh, publishing a popular piece of software, and so forth. By the time you put together your application file, all the stuff will have already been done and you won't be able to change that. What you will be able to do in those last few months and weeks up to the submission deadline is to put together a great project proposal, which maybe compensate for some weaknesses in the rest, and this will show that you are knowledgeable and passionate about the field, for example, machine learning in your case, that you know the stuff that's already been done in the field, you know where you want to start from, you know where you want to be heading to, and why you think that that's an important contribution that someone you should make. Of all the parts of your application, that is the part where you can make a positive difference even at such a late stage. And so you should work carefully on that. If you do your homework well, you will find out who the professors are that work in the area you're interested in at the university you're applying to. In your case, machine learning, okay? So check them out. What subfield of machine learning are they interested in? What have they been working on lately? What have they published recently? If they have a blog, for example, what have they blogged about? And so on. Consider getting in touch with them and running your ideas past them and making an intellectual connection on the basis of your common interests and then fine-tuning your project proposal according to what they say to you. What will not work? An email like this, and I get tons of these. You know, respected, uh, most honorable sir, I am X from University X and I got X grade point average so far and I am passionate about X and I'm a big fan of your work and I would love to do a master in machine learning with you. Please accept me as your student and support my application. So this is not very enticing for the recipient, and it's especially not interesting if you've sent it to all the professors in the department. We have ways of telling if you did that. So this kind of generic spam just goes straight in the bin, even if you had a really high GPA, regardless of whatever you put in those X's. If you want to be taken seriously, your letter should not focus on what matters to you, but on what matters to the recipient. Of course, everyone and their dog would love to get a degree from here. You don't have to tell us that. That's not the point. What does matter is what do you bring to the table? Why will it be good for me to have you as my graduate student rather than the next applicant? What exciting thing will we be able to do together that I wouldn't be able to do without you? Think seriously about this. That's probably the most important thing you can do at application time. All the other important things you can do for being accepted, you should have already done them over the previous three years. But this is the one you can still do now. If you did identify a preferred supervisor, someone that you would really like to become the student of, then do put their name on the application. And if you do that, it will be sent to them. And it will be sent to other people as well. It's always sent to, to several people uh, so that they can assess it. And this will happen regardless of whether you've been in touch with them before or not. My main advice is in your application, make yourself useful to your prospective supervisor. Because that, alongside your brilliance, of course, will be the most compelling reason for them to want to admit you. Because, believe it or not, we do want to admit great people that it would be fun and exciting and intellectually stimulating to work with. We do.